So, good morning and, and welcome. Uh, my name's Roger Berkowitz again. Thank you very much for uh, joining us for the second day of the Hannah Arendt Sanders Conference, our seventh conference, The Unmaking of Americans. Are there still American values worth fighting for? Is, is, this, is this hearable? Are you hearing me? I, I'm also, uh, I, I didn't announce this yesterday. I, I have to admit I didn't know, but um, there are some infrared hearing aid devices available uh, for those of you who, if I know there were some people who had trouble hearing yesterday, they're available at the table uh, at the entrance, the merchandise table. And if you're uh, interested in attaining a, a, an infrared hearing device, uh, we do have them. Uh, we had a, uh, some of you I know were here yesterday, some weren't. We had a, a, a really wonderful opening day. Uh, uh, we talked about um, the, the history of American exceptionalism uh, from, from people like John Winthrop and Thomas Paine uh, through to Alexis de Tocqueville, Abraham Lincoln, and uh, Langston Hughes and, and Martin Luther King. We had an opening panel with Charles Murray and, and, and George Packer, uh, in which we came to some very interesting agreements about the mutual uh, dysfunction of both government and business and the loss of faith in institutions in this country, and how, in effect, talking about corruption and the corruption of the people and the corruption of the institutions was actually part of the American exceptionalist idea, the American idea of, in a sense, uh, in talking about corruption, trying to return America to its ideas, that when, when we come to see it failing and we complain about it not living up to the idea of America is exactly when we begin to uh, regenerate that idea. Um, it was, a, it was a, a provocative, I think, and, and at times a uh, uh, really exciting day I, I think today is going to be equally provocative and exciting. I'm, I'm really thrilled you're all here. Uh, there are going to be a bunch of students coming in fairly soon, uh, and so I, I hope they'll be quiet, but to the extent people can I'll let them sit down quietly as, as, as much as possible, that would be appreciated. Um, uh, before we begin the formal program, we're going to do what we did yesterday. Uh, and, and begin with one poem about America. So I'd like to introduce Marisol Dotard uh, from Bard College, who will be reading America by Claude McKay. Although, she feeds me bread of bitterness and sings into my throat her tiger's tooth, stealing my breath of life. I will confess I love this cultured hell that tests my youth. Her vigor flows like tides into my blood, giving me strength erect against her hate. Her bigness sweeps my being like a flood, yet as a rebel fronts a king in state, I stand within her walls with not a shred of terror, malice, not a word of jeer. Darkly, I gaze into the days ahead and see her might and granite wonders there, beneath the touch of time's unerring hand, like priceless treasures sinking into the sand. Uh, I'd now like to uh, introduce our, our first speaker who's going to uh, get us started today. Uh, it's, it's Leon Botstein, the president of the college, Bard College, and the Leon Levy Professor in the Arts and Humanities. Uh, president Botstein has been the editor of the Musical Quarterly since 1992. He's the musical director and conductor of the American Symphony Orchestra and the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra. And he's the author of Jefferson's Children, Education and the Promise of American Culture. He's going to be talking today about education and American education. Please welcome Leon Botstein.
first, I wanted to thank Roger and all his colleagues uh, for organizing these conferences, which are uh, terrific events and which we conferences we look forward to um, every year. Uh, and um, I want to thank all of you for coming. And indeed, I understand that some students from the Bard High School Early Colleges, of which we have two in New York, one in Cleveland, one in Newark, and a program in New Orleans, and one in the Harlem Children's Zone in New York City. So it's a smattering of things from all of them that will enter, so um, they'll find their way uh, gracefully into the empty seats. Um, so Roger, um, uh, I originally had, he had originally thought it would be appropriate on a symbolic basis for me to, to open yesterday, but um, the American Academy in Berlin, which is a 20-year-old institution, uh, opened its, um, uh, celebrated its 20th anniversary, and they had asked me to speak at their 20th anniversary gala, which I did. And um, uh, so I came back yesterday from Berlin, and uh, apropos of this topic, uh, I thought it was very touching. The American Academy of Berlin, many of you don't know, is an institution uh, that was founded by Richard Holbrook and Henry Kissinger right after the fall of the wall. And it is a place where artists, politicians, uh, intellectuals, scholars go and are in residence. Ironically, in the home of the banking family of Arnhold, which was the, the bankers for Bismarck, Bleichwerder Arnhold, um, on the Wannsee, within visual distance of the villa in which the final solution uh, was uh, mapped out by the Nazi hierarchy. Um, and um, this uh, fabulous villa, which then became the home of the American officer corps uh, in the Cold War, uh, after the removal of American troops, the question was, what kind of institution should be built in Berlin that is American, that's not military? And um, they ended up creating a cultural institution which has fellowships and conferences, a kind of Hannah Arendt Center, if you will, in Berlin, under the guise of the name the American Academy. And it was created by the philanthropy of German Jews, uh, who had emigrated to the United States and had this idea of doing something particularly special in a reunified Germany. Actually, an initiative with, with which Hannah Arendt would have been entirely sympathetic. And, um, but the most poignant thing about it is that it's relevant to the topic we're, we're discussing today in the following way, that the institution, the American Academy, was created in order, in my view, to try to start again on a proposition that had evidently failed. And that proposition was um, to link education and culture to the conduct of public life. So the rise of fascism and the success of the Nazis was absolutely proof positive of the failure of culture the cultivation of judgment and taste in the aesthetic realm, of what in German is called Bildung, or in German Kultur, civilization, if you will, that that kind of discernment and education as in a way of improving one's behavior as a citizen and in the public realm. In other words, culture, discernment, refinement, and taste were not only not resistors, to barbarism in modern politics, or to tyranny. Quite the opposite, they ended up being willing collaborators. It was fascinating that the victims of this failure, precisely the community that had a deep emotional investment in the power of culture and education to improve ethical behavior and political behavior, the people who had the most invested in that proposition, therefore the Jews who, that, who had developed place in German society since emancipation in the late 18th century, that constituency refunded the restart in Germany for this proposition. Now, what is it relevant to America? If the question that Roger put to me is, what are we fighting for? And in my view, this is only my view, I'm not a political theorist. I was a student of Hannah Arendt's, but that doesn't give me any privilege, except I'm probably the only person in the room to have known her. Um, but other than that, um, 
I'm an outsider, so I do not speak with the voice of authority, but simply the voice of an observer. What we're fighting for is, in my view, um, precisely the intersection of politics and culture in the following way. We talk about democracy, but in point of fact, democracy is dangerous. And that's something we are very unwilling to admit. It's dangerous because it has an inherent intention, inherent tension with equality, which we do not wish to acknowledge. The idea of one person, one vote, and the emphasis on the processes of democracy, elections. In the most radical way, they're visible in the second election of Viktor Orban in Hungary, earning a two-thirds majority. It is visible in Putin and the whole theory of an illiberal democracy. It is the uncomfortable reality of the Egyptian election then set aside undemocratically of the Muslim Brotherhood. The perils of mass democracy, of course, with Tocqueville and every, not, are not new. But we live them, and we live them in a way in which we are uniquely powerless to do anything about it. The perils of democracy are the following in my view. First of all, it is the inexorable power of conformity and uniformity. For all our talk of freedom, individuality, exceptionalism, eccentricity, that legendary Vermont farmer who's impressed with no one, or the gun-toting Aryan supremacist in the hills of Oklahoma, who thinks it his constitutional right to have an AK-47, the fact remains that most of our thinking is uniform, borrowed, and imitative. In such a circumstance, the second peril of mass democracy is an absolute rage against excellence. Anything that actually is different and of commanding merit. There are exceptions, but those exceptions fall, unfortunately, and I do not say so with any snobbery. It's not that Beyonce is not someone who I, I admire. My hat off to anyone who achieves anything remotely like that. For my proverbial money, when Carnegie Hall was reopened in the late 80s, in a renovation, there was a gala con concert, anybody was anybody in classical music was on the stage, the greatest artist to set on that stage was not Vladimir Horowitz, but Frank Sinatra. So it's not a matter of a kind of highbrow, lowbrow snobbery. But excellence, which is knowledge that is counterintuitive and not easily expressed, whether it is in quantum physics, or it is the scholarship in the humanities about history that um, explodes a popular legend, such as the stab in the back legend about the loss of the First World War by the Germans, or the idea that we're taught in school um, that the 17th century in America was a kind of peaceful, bucolic conversation about uh, creating a new nation without any bloodshed genocide or slavery. So excellence and real distinction and merit are not actually goods that sell well in mass democracy. The third problem is that we live proudly with empty freedoms, freedoms we don't use. The problem is not that there is no freedom of speech the problem is that nobody actually uses it. And insofar as people use it, our problem is not freedom of speech, it is the willingness to listen. With the internet, anybody can say anything he or she wants. It's a sewer of undifferentiated opinion that all looks alike. 
The conformity of our relationship to it, of course, is aggravated, exacerbated by Google and by Amazon, by the algorithms that really allow us to see only things we already know. Most people go to public lectures to hear something they already believe. Nobody goes to a public lecture to actually have his or her blood pressure heightened unless the doctor has ordered it for fear that they might actually faint to dead away um, to hear something they don't want to hear. People take dissent personally, and that stops the conversation. When we talk really about freedoms, what point is the freedom when we are about to enter a presidential debate in our democracy in which it is absolutely implausible that in the process of the debate, one candidate will be convinced that her or his position is wrong on the basis of evidence and a good argument? Imagine, I would vote for anyone who would say, that's an argument I hadn't thought of. And the facts you have brought to bear make my position wrong? Completely implausible. In our technological space, the fourth problem is that the empty freedoms, I would call the empty freedoms, and the intolerance of dissent leads actually to absolute inability for people in political life and in public life to compromise. Consensus is achieved by self-censorship and silence. People withdraw. They concede to a consensus which is not about enthusiasm, but about essentially giving up, retreating into a private space. They don't want to debate the proposition. So our ability to compromise is much reduced. We see that, of course, in politics. And the other, of course, is our ability to lose gracefully. Part of living in a democracy is the ability, actually, um, to lose gracefully. The whole principle of a jury trial, assuming that um, the trial is a level playing field. So let's not talk about discriminatory juries. Let's not talk about corrupt prosecution. Let's assume you're accused of a crime. I actually pose this once. I don't do this anymore because I know this is, this is a public talk. So there used to be these something called Aspen seminars in Aspen, Colorado, which was, you know, great books. Mortimer Adler had created this thing with Robert Hutchins in the late 40s. And it was a pretty good idea. It's kind of great books and grown-ups, not college students, come and read Plato and Aristotle, and you sort of lead these things. And they're interesting people. They're usually people from business. They pay a lot of money to spend two weeks trying to think hard. The, the, this is, this is a, a premise which is a little offensive. Um, you know, it's, um, we don't do it in sports, but people know that in order to play tennis, even in a moderately proper way, one has to do it on a regular basis. The idea that one can be thoughtless for years and then spend two summers in Aspen, Colorado, and suddenly wake up and suddenly begin to know how to think, as if knowing how to think is a kind of passive thing you sort of plug in and then it suddenly works. So it's a light bulb. It isn't a light bulb. It's hard work. You know, it's really hard work. And um, so I was leading one of these seminars, and I posed the following question. There was a couple where executive, an executive and his wife from a southwestern firm, big firm, who were born again uh, Christians, evangelical Christians. I respected that a lot. Uh, I, I can understand very well why someone uh, would adhere to... Um, a very, uh, very well integrated and worked out religious community with an extremely straightforward theology. The great thing about religion is that um, ambiguity doesn't do it well. And, uh, and ambiguity is hard to tolerate, as hard as is complexity. So I, I, um, I pose the following question. I don't know what text we were reading, it may be from the Federalist Papers. And uh, I, I said, so imagine you're in a trial, a jury trial uh, for a crime. And um, you agree to the jury. The jury is a jury of your peers. 
that the judge is someone you have no objection to. And there's been no tampering with the evidence. There is no distortion of the proceedings. So it's a fair trial. And a verdict comes in that you believe, in your own words, to be wrong, right? Would you accept the verdict of the court, if, particularly if the verdict of the court were in conflict with what you believe is the will of God? A very reasonable proposition. Many such propositions. Abortion is a very quick one that comes to mind, obviously. But there are many where civil law and its claims and the responsibilities we have as citizens to abide by the law in a rule of law may require us to do things which actually are in direct conflict with a religious claim on our behavior. And these two people said no. Without thinking, no. What kind of democracy is that? Democracy which you're not willing to lose even though you know you're right. So what's admirable about the letter that Martin Luther King wrote from Birmingham jail is not that it is the kind of argument by an African-American intellectual that's acceptable to white people, unlike some of the writings of Eldridge Cleaver or Malcolm X. It is the fact that he makes it quite clear that he's breaking the law, and he's willing to go to jail for it. He's willing to lose. The fifth and most um, difficult challenge to democracy is, in, in my view, is um, the way we construe the relationship of individual benefit to the public good. So. This is a complicated area, but it is at the root of our tolerance of radical economic in inequality. Um, so, so government is all right unless it bothers our rights. Government is all right, it doesn't do with me. Government is okay when I need it, but when I don't need it, it's, it's a heinous instrument. Um, and so there is a kind of inherent absence of an ability to reconcile my individual rights, my individual rights, with the common good. Now, if you take those five perils, they can be classed uh, in the inadequacy of the, of the description of democracy as a process, as opposed to trying to confront what the substance of a democratic life is. So merely having elections uh, is, um, is not enough. So this leads me to, to ask the question, what are we fighting for and how do we fight for it? So if we're going to fight for a concept of democracy, which actually solves these things, so it allows us to break the absolutely terrifying hand of uniformity, that actually allows us to celebrate excellence, that allows us to live with grace, dissent, and to encounter dissent, that gives us the capacity to change our minds, to lose, and to compromise, and also to find a way to believe that we have been entitled to our individual pursuit of happiness in a way that's consistent with the public good or the common good, I'm always amazed by those the most privileged who um, do their best not to pay taxes. The argument of every mayoral candidate is that if she or he should increase taxes, we will move out of the city. And these are probably, a lot of them are donors to liberal causes. It's a good example of the irreconcilability of the public good, which they believe in, and suddenly their pocketbook. I was so impressed when I was a beginning college president, one of our trustees was the uh, spouse of Nicholas Katzenbach, the attorney general and a great figure. 
And I went to raise money from him. He was vice president of IBM at the time. And, um, and I was terribly naive. I didn't know what I was doing. But I knew somehow that giving money was tax deductible. <laughs> that much I knew. And, um, and so I went. So I'm sitting from Nick. We became friends. And they were uh, two, children, two of their children went to Bard. And so I, um, I was talking to Mr. Kassenbach and saying to him, you know, and trying to encourage him to give money. And I, I must have said something. Of course, this is to the former Attorney General of the United States. I mean, it was a little stupid of me, but you only learn by making mistakes. I said, and uh, Mr. Kassenbach, you know, it's tax deductible. So, so, so uh, Nick Kassenbach, so leaned back, he was very kindly, and he had pity on me, and he said, he said, you know, it's very nice of you to say, but I, I'm sort of a, I have a peculiar idea. I believe myself to be privileged and a public servant. I take no deductions whatsoever, even though I'm entitled to them. I pay my full tax. And the only person it reminded me of was my own father did exactly the same thing. He was an immigrant. For him, it was a privilege to pay taxes. So how do we change the, the character of democracy to address those five failures? So obviously, it's our, our, it's our line of work, so to speak. So we, we take a page from John Stuart Mill, and he's not the only one, from John Dewey, and we say, well, education seems to be the answer. If we could educate the electorate in a system of public education, we would have a better democracy. Now, this is a very dangerous proposition because giving degrees hasn't done it. We have the worst political system, most dysfunctional system, and we have the system, and we have the largest number of our citizens who hold degrees from institutions of higher education. In fact, it's the act's opposite. We were better off when nobody went to school and people were illiterate. So it's, it's the up opposite. We have people who have MD degrees in Congress, PhDs in political science, putting forth fictions that have the cognitive status of astrology. No. So, so the question is, how, what, how does that work? I mean, how does that work? How is that possible? So this link between education and democracy is, is great for sort of, you know, commencement speeches, but it, 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 it doesn't bear a lot of close scrutiny. On the other hand, there is a negative proposition. So if it doesn't below, it demand scrutiny, clearly ignorance isn't the solution. So the, there is some obligation to revisit the question of whether you could make a link between education and democracy that might be effective. The first thing to discover is that um, it's not going to be done by what either the Bush or the Obama administrations have put forth as national policy. This is the most ridiculous and unproductive approach to American education. It's well-meaning. Um, but it, uh, it talk about standardization and assessment and harassing teachers, no matter how poorly trained and cynical you may think the teachers are. You don't improve education by declaring war on the people who deliver it. You know, um, you don't improve Catholicism by going after the faithful. These are people who chose this profession. And most of them chose it for good reasons. Nobody, even in the worst education school, has chosen education, and the inner dialogue in some kind of graphic novel would be, I want this job because it's not a lot of hard work, and there's something called tenure, and I can do nothing for the rest of my life, and get a huge pension, and stick it to all my neighbors. No one does this in this profession. So something went wrong in the way they were treated as teachers that made them as difficult as people now believe them to be as represented by their unions. So 
We're not going to solve this through the current mode of education policy. First step is to stop privatizing public education. That, that's the first important step. Now, I don't think uh, the mayor, you know, who went after charter schools, it was not politically perhaps the most graceful thing to do, and he sort of backed off properly so, because in the context of the failure of public schools, what ch many charter schools have done is perfectly reasonable. There's nothing ideological about this. When I say don't privatize private edu uh, public education, what I mean is that it is also not that one uniform system of public education is what needs to be provided to the public. See, we have to rethink how public education delivers to the common citizenry as a, na as a public good education. And it may not be the way it was done 50 years ago. How can it be a uniform system with a uniform standardized curriculum, all this kind of stuff? It may not be that. And maybe we have a lot to learn from those few charter schools that have been successful. So one is to actually reignite a real commitment to public education. If we were in a Putin-esque democracy, and there was a real capacity to exercise tyranny, the quickest way to improve public schools would be to outlaw all private schools and force the rich and wealthy back into the public school system. In the city of New York, I would tell you, overnight standards would improve, <laughs> curriculum would improve, equipment would improve. Overnight, if you emptied out Collegiate, Trinity, Spence, Exeter, Andover, suddenly our public system would flourish. This, unfortunately, is not constitutional. <laughs> so the second thing is to rethink radically how we recruit and how we train teachers and how we treat them as professionals in the classrooms. That's absolutely number one priority. And the third is to rethink the educational experience as such. For example, what a, how a school building is used, what days of the week it is used. I believe in radical age integration. I believe that a school building should be a community center in which adults go to study in the same space as little children that you need to have the full span of the recipients of education using the school as a common ground for the experience of the population, especially the older population, what once was the grandparental population. And that is rethinking um, what once was the function of public libraries uh, that become also integrated in how we think of the school buildings and the school uh, communities. And obviously, technology has a terrifically positive role uh, to play in that. And uh, what's the school day look like? Is it continuous or discontinuous? Should it be done with a summer vacation? And if there is vacation, what kind of vacation? What is the relation between the so-called after school and the in school? These are huge opportunities to do things which we actually don't. How we integrate the school with the public institutions that exist in every community, and they range from the churches uh, to museums to libraries um, uh, to a variety of, uh, of institutions, including those of sports and recreation and essentially the artistic institutions. The fourth area, of course, is directly tied to what we do here, and that is to rethink the liberal arts. Now, there's a lot of been written about the liberal arts and a lot of been written about uh, college education. Most of it is nonsensical, uh, very defensive, uh, very rhetorical. It reads more like sermons, and the only people who believe it are the people who already bought into the religion. Uh, sermonizing is a very different, difficult art because there's nobody in the room that hasn't already conceded that they're inclined to believe what you're going to say. Um, the real power of sermonizing is to bring a Protestant pastor into a synagogue and uh, see how far he gets. And, um, uh, and uh, uh, that would be true, true preaching, um, uh, uh, preaching for conversion or change of mind. Um, but the fact is that um, most institutions do not deliver on the liberal arts. It's just academic pieties. 
these are professional PhDs, they get jobs, they teach what they want to teach in departments that are structured after graduate school models. It's disciplinary. It really has nothing to do with the problems that might be on the minds of young people who come for an education in college. It's irresponsible. We call it the liberal arts. The only thing that's really different about it is that, unlike Europe, uh, students can take courses in a wide variety of fields and sort of shop around in terms of their interests and put together their own variety of curricula. And that the teaching largely in the United States is better than it is in Europe. Class sizes are smaller. There's more emphasis on written work and more interaction in the classroom. But we're not doing enough, absolutely not enough, in terms of redeeming what university study is about. So it seems to me that um, uh, any hope for redeeming American democracy, and in a pluralist society, so we are exceptional in the sense that we are continue to be an immigrant nation, and uh, that will continue. And the real problem we face, given the demographics of the United States, is, in my opinion, not questions of inequalities of race, gender, or sexual preference. The real quality is, the real problem is a real tolerance of the inequalities of thinking and also the differences. The other is not about a reductive racial question. It's about living in a world where a minority thinking can flourish. And not only in science, where the so-called exceptional thought ends up being right. Now, there are many barriers to achieving this, and I'll end with this. There is, of course, the whole question of money and politics. Given, despite our education, the incredible, incredible, the reason there's money in politics is because it works. Now, there are some weird exceptions. So you have the woman who ran against Cuomo who had no money and did fantastically well, but the expectations were so low, and she's not the governor. So I don't think this is a particularly endearing failure. I, too, can run for office without any money and do better than the worst prediction. <laughs> the issue is, can you win without money? Now, there is that the person who defeated Eric Cantor. Yes, it's probably easy to topple completely deluded egomaniacs. It's probably possible to do so who've lost touch with why they're there in the first place. If he had you know, kept to his knitting, proverbially so, he would have won. And the Tea Party has shown us that it is possible to unseat. And look at Ferguson. The fact is, in that election, which is held in April, right, only 17% of the electorate shows up. So probably you could win without a lot of money there, too. And money in politics isn't that important on the local level, where most of the dysfunction of democracy actually exists, as we can see from the Ferguson case. The problems are not only in Washington. The problems are local as well. But money in politics is a real problem because it does work. The second, of course, is an overriding moralism in the way we talk about politics. That's the second barrier. That has to do with the personalization of dissent and the belief that your political position is actually graced by a truth value that is higher than its efficacy, that it derives from a set of moral codes that somehow have no appeal to argument. And last, and I'll close with this, I've gone longer than I was expected, so I apologize, is um, merely greed. You know, we've taken Emerson's belief in Americans' exceptional capacity for self-reliance uh, uh, to a kind of celebration, you know, who's the person we admire most? The richest people in America, Steve Jobs, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates. With that kind of value system, no democracy, remotely approximately anything that Hannah Arendt in her most sort of sentimental moments about the possibilities of America would have dreamed were possible can be done.
on that optimistic note, have a very nice day. <laughs>